Welcome to the BHB Trilogy Podcast with your host, Beast, Hot Sauce, and Buckets. Welcome to the BHB Trilogy Podcast, episode 17, here with Mr. Cliff Baker, or aka Coach Baker, my trainer, and here with Beast, Stella, and Buckets, Eli. And I'm your host, Sauce. So, Coach Cliff, the best trainer in California, grew up in Laverne, played overseas and trained some of the best players in the world. So, Coach, can you, like, give us some background on your life? Uh, well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to get on here and share with you guys. I am, one, always impressed when I see young people like yourselves that are taking the world by the reins and doing things that are, you know, outside of your comfort zone, but things that are going to really expand your horizons and, you know, your community's horizons. So I want to thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. Um, you said a lot of stuff there. Um, best trainer. Uh, I appreciate the title, but, you know, I'm just one of these guys in here that's happy to be a part of the game and try to push the narrative for, further so we can um, continue to let this beautiful game grow. Um, mm -hmm. I did grow up in the Laverne area. I guess that's where our house was. Um, my family actually had us all over Southern California. I'm the first generation of my family to be in California. Um, and it's ironic that, oh really? My, yeah, my nickname is actually, it's Cali Cliff. And I got that cause I was, I went to school in Alabama at Alabama and it was Oakwood university first. And then I went to play at Alabama A&M, but I was always, there was another guy named Cliff on the team and uh -huh. I was Cali Cliff. So a lot of times I would walk in or someone would say something like, well, no, 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 it's Cali Clip. So that was kind of the thing. And then I remember calling a lot of my friends back when I was, uh, I guess I'd, after we had been done in college. I'm like, what's up? It's Cliff. Cliff? Yeah, Cali Clip. Oh, what's up? Like, you know, so that's kind of how that name came. So California has been the home for me. Laverne has been where the house has been. But I was blessed to be in that travel ball era where it wasn't a lot of, uh, like the map wasn't around, there wasn't a lot of facilities and stuff like that. So, you know, my dad was taking me all over, whether it's LA, up in the Valley, San Diego, wherever we can get the hoops. Um, so growing up in Southern California was a blessing because, you know, we had Nick Young running around, Tony Farmer, Gilbert Arenas's and James Harden's. We had kind of an epic time in LA. Um, and this is before like the social media aspect was around and YouTube. so. You couldn't just sit mm -hmm. behind the camera and watch them. You had to go and get the smoke. Like you had to go pull up at the gym um, to be able to go play. So yeah, it was a blessing to be able to grow up in the California area. Um, and I think you talk about being able to work with some of the better hoopers in the world. California is a hub. You know, this is the NBA offseason. This is really most back basketball meccas offseason. We got the Drew League. We got uh, Vegas is right there for NBA Summer League. And a lot of execs go back and forth between LA and Vegas. Yeah. Um, and it was a lot of opportunities, you know, travel balls, big out here, high school basketball, a lot of things. So, yeah, it's been a, it's been a blessing to just be in the culture. I can't say that, like, anything that I've done has been necessarily more special than the next. But I take a page out of Nipsey's book. I just didn't quit. I just went through every emotion of it. You know, it's really been a marathon and I love the marathon aspect of it. There's times where you get to run fast and there's times where you got to sit and kind of check your steps out and plan your next moves. And there's times where you mm -hmm. just blow. So it's been a blessing to be in Southern California. I think that's helped tremendously um, to allow me to get exposure as a trainer and also expose me to a number of different training modalities and players. So um, yeah, California has been a blessing to me and growing up here, that's pretty much my background as far as me as a trainer in this area. So how did you get into coaching slash training? I got into coaching slash training because of, uh, realistically because of a car accident, if I'm going to be honest. Um, I was playing basketball. My, I never wanted to coach or train basketball, even when I was coming up playing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I don't really know why. I just, my family's more into the medical field and music. Like I'm the only one in my family that doesn't, isn't, I guess, classically trained at an instrument. I'm the more of the, more sports, athletics. Sports, athletics. I did. I played a lot of instruments growing up, but mm -hmm. my sister took it all the way to the ranch. She does that for a living. My father did that for a living. My mom's classically trained. Like, they all get to do that. So my craft was more so basketball. Um, but 
yeah, in general, the training aspect came because I was in a car accident. I was in 2006, August 6, 2006. I was uh, coming. I was actually out here for training because we had mm -hmm. Alabama a and at the time playing. And I was yeah. out on summer training. And I was leaving this job that I had through this temp agency. Um, and really, I don't remember the whole day because of I was in a coma for six days and some, I had some head trauma and things like that. Um, but because of that accident, it sidelined me. And I had to stay home to do rehab and do a bunch of other things. And I needed a car. And I worked at a school. My mom was the deputy superintendent of Pomona Unified School District. So I needed a car. And I, uh, they had a job. They offered me a good check to do basketball stuff. And so I took it. And then I fell in love with the aspect because I felt like they, the kids just weren't getting what I felt they needed. It was a lot of like mm -hmm. just lame, lame stuff they were teaching the kids. So I just took it on myself to take my JV team and do what we did. They ended up getting the best record out of the school that year. They fired the entire coaching staff. This is at Kenesha High School. They fired the entire coaching staff except me, and they kept me on. So I kind of felt like that was a sign that this is something I could be good at. Um, and I just kept going from there. Went to Gary High School and ended up coaching at La Sierra University where I got my master's and the rest of history. So, all right, continue. So, like, uh, the car accident happened here in California? Mm -hmm. Happened in Harupa Valley. So I ended up at Arrowhead Regional Medical Center. Stayed there for about a week. And then they let me out. So like a six-day coma? You can't remember anything from the coma, right? No, everybody always asks me that. I don't, I don't have any like dream stories or lucid dream stories or me and God were hanging I out shooting hoops none of that was it like you got you got in the, do you remember the accident like you just or was it like you got in the accident and you just woke up i i remember leaving work the only reason i even came back to california in the summer was because the trainer that i worked with at citrus community college helped me gain about 15 18 pounds of muscle and he increased my vertical by like eight inches he was like godsend. Like if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have been able to keep playing um, college basketball. And I came back to work with him. Um, and of course, get a chance to see my family and everything. Um, but I was supposed to leave two weeks after that. Like I was August 6th, I think that was. And I was supposed to leave like August 20th or 21st. So I was almost out of there. So uh, was it like they woke you up and you were just like confusing everything? Like I woke up on my own and my leg, what my right leg was raised. I just, I was in the bed. I had all these wires on me and I woke up and I had a, my leg was raised and there was a nurse on my left doing something to like my food or something like that. And um, when I woke up, I was very nervous because I was, I was leaving work. I was leaving work, getting ready to go work out. And then mm -hmm. I wake up in a hospital and I'm nervous about that. And then she starts telling, like, it's okay, calm down, you're fine. You're in an accident. You've been in a coma for a little bit. You're... And then tells me I was out, I guess, for when she told me like six days, and then I just passed right back out. I just remember like being in shock. And I just kind of passed out. And I woke up again, and my family was there and stuff. And then got a, another day in, and then they checked me out, saw my neurologist and everything, and went out. So I want to take it to. January 26, 2020, mm, yeah. the day that Kobe passed away. So that date's going to be with us for a long time. Yeah. So what were your like initial reactions? I was hurt. I was shocked. I was working. Well, how, out how did you hour. find out? I was working out of 24 hour fitness. Uh, I was on the turf part that they have there and I was finishing up mm -hmm. my my plyo stuff and my functional movement stuff and getting ready to go to like some just strength stuff. And I remember finishing my last reps and I got a text on like this group text. And normally on my phone, when I work out, it's like, do not disturb. But on the do not yeah. disturb, you get like a favorites list. Right. So yeah. people in my favorites list were like my cousins or something like that. And the group chat has like eight people. So they were like, Oh, uh, yo, Kobe just died in a helicopter crash. And I'm like, okay. Good job. Joke, joke, joke. Ha, ha, ha. And mm -hmm. then he sends me the thing, and it was like, 
TMZ. So I'm like, oh, cool. bro, come on, it's TMZ. So I go back to working out, and then I hear some body in the gym go, oh, and I just hear like this little like shot, like somebody had passed away. I'm like, oh, what the heck? And so I look over it, and now I go back on my phone, and now they're sending all kinds of stuff. And so I'm like, let me go check for myself. So I go online, and sure mm-hmm. enough, bro, like when I saw it, it said Kobe Bryant died in a helicopter crash, my heart just sunk. Like even right now, I can feel the knot welling up. My heart just sunk. And mm-hmm. I remember just crying. Like I was on the, I was on a machine, and I was crying, and I remember this dude looking at me, and I was just on some like, what would Kobe do? So I just started gutting that workout out, bro. And I just ate the rest of that workout. I was probably crying all the way through it but there's people all now people are getting around tvs and all that so it was it was tough um but at the same time the nipsey's passing had prepared me for that and for what what we need to do um and not really procrastinating in the moment and spending a lot of time uh we got to mourn the man and give him his time but at the same time there's a lot of work that still needs to be done you know so go ahead was it like like a feeling of shock in the gym Shock. Like everyone was just like, like of, did everyone stop what they're doing or like? The gym got quiet for sure. The gym, like the music was still playing and everything, but you, everyone was kind of stopped. And there was, there's like those TVs that are by the, the um, bikes and all that. Yeah. Everybody was like walking, looking, and then like I just, I at that point I couldn't really do it, so I just put my hood on, kept doing my workout, went to the steam room, tried to get my meditation on, and then bounced. So what was Kobe's impact in the basketball world? In the basketball world, uh, I think it was enormous. I think he was a bit of a bridge, especially in the last bit of conversation we've been able to have with guys. Um, he was a bridge to an era that I think has been lost. Um, he also, I feel like, gave you guys a look behind the curtain to what, like we type this GOAT conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, when you guys have seen Kobe Bryant work out more than your boy LeBron, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I've seen Kobe in po- and like in person, like at tournaments and stuff. Okay, you've seen more Kobe, but I'm saying like you've seen more of Kobe's actual workouts. Like you could go online and find a. Kobe oh yeah, yeah. Or Kobe will tell you how to do this, or Kobe saying this is what you shoot your shot. Kobe yeah. gave so much. Like I'm just me. Or like his book, his book. The book. The, the children's books, the sitting on the bench and coaching a team. Like he gave so much more than any, I, I'm, I'm, my argument is actually than any person of genius has, of genius. So if you talk about like Albert Einstein, I mean, did he have interns? Probably, but Thomas Edison's like, oh, got, but Kobe gave the stuff away. Mm-hmm. It's not like an online program. You just tap in. Let me go get my Mamba workout on the Mamba app, and it's, you got to pay for it. You can go online and get it for free. Like, that's huge. I think that's the biggest thing that he did is of someone who didn't have to. Like, you talk about Mozart and Van Gogh and Steve Jobs or anybody who's just the top of their industry. They're not giving it away. They're selling it to you in the form of an iPhone and an app and all these continuous things, or Apple Music and whatever. He gave it away for free. <clears throat> So how can we keep his legacy alive? We got to pay it forward. My mom used to tell me that all the time. Like, you can't really say thank you to somebody who has everything and did it for you. Like, the thank yous that you guys could say to your mom and dad, that's cute. You can go get him a card, like, make him breakfast or whatever it is. The best mm-hmm. thing you can do is to go take everything that they invested in you and give them a return on the investment, right? So all that Kobe invested into the culture, our job is just to give them the return on the investment. Should we change the NBA logo to Kobe? I've been saying that before he passed. I said it was supposed to be Jordan before he mm-hmm. passed. Um, I, the tough part for me is I'm not a big fan of reactive stuff. So like, yeah, it, he died, right? Huh? Because he died. Is that? Yeah. Like, now he died. All of a sudden, we're gonna give it to him. So now somebody else got to die, and then we change the logo again. Like, I don't really. That's kind of my thing. I don't really like reactive stuff. Um, but. I do feel like there's a lot of way. I mean, they changed the entire All Star game for the man. Yeah, did I? I like the way that all the teams like paid respect. They had before his daughter's jersey on. What? They had his daughter's jersey number on. Who's that good? Where they transcend to where their kid, their daughter, gets to be an NBA face? That's elite. 
Or like, were you, uh, when you found out that his daughter died, were you kind of like? That I, I'll be honest with you, I still have not been able to go look at any of that. I have not seen, I have not seen anything from the funeral. Because like, I, I heard that he died and then, and then they were like, oh, his daughter died. That broke my heart. Deanna, and I was like, oh, damn. That, that part broke my heart because one it is a child that did not get to step into all of her blossoming and doing her greatness and all of the stuff that we had lined up for her right mm -hmm. we believe everything happens for a reason i'm sure it did but my humanness won't allow me to really understand why she was taken um but at the same time i trust and serve and know that the god we serve his ways are not our ways but all things work out for the good. So I know there must be a plan for it. Um, but my heart kind of for her more so went out to like the kids your age and stuff. Cause mm -hmm. I know y'all think y'all were working out. <laughs> I know y'all thought you were like, Oh, I'm gonna get a scholarship. Oh. Yeah. She was for sure <laughs> going to like honor. She didn't even really have to be good. Like mm -hmm. she, but she was. And so it's just tough because I mean I had players that my a, gr a girl that I trained Ryan Bennett, her um, you saw that move where uh, Gianna made the little shimmy and hit the bucket. They had it on yeah. all life and all that. Okay, that girl is Ryan. I trained that girl. That's that's guarding her, right? Mm -hmm. And again, before I say it, we love Gigi, love the whole get down, but Ryan was giving her problems. Like the first game they played, and Ryan gave her like twenty six. Right, Gigi had a free throw. The second game they played him, Gigi had that basket, and Ryan had 24. Right, and so she put like Kobe had Ryan and this other girl Kennedy and a couple other ones on Gigi's kill list. Right, so it was a mm -hmm. blessing to be a part of that motivation and inspiration for a future elite hooper, someone who was supposed to be carrying the women's game to the next level. You know, yeah. and you saw Kobe doing the work in the women's game kind of setting the table for when she would arrive. And so it's, it's sad to see that that won't happen. And that's what breaks my heart the most is because again, Kobe was investing in this game in ways that no one had before. Who had taken the women's game and put it on his back like that, given all the pub, going sit in front row, doing, he probably went to more WNBA games than he did NBA games. Yeah. You know, so like those kind of things, I am sad the most because I mean, girl dad, like he made it a hashtag. You know what I mean? Like he was really making it cool. Girls basketball wasn't even cool. I don't even think May Hoops would have gave girls basketball a thing if it wasn't for Kobe. You know, so there's a lot that I, I'm going to miss and I really feel bad for, especially when it comes to like his daughter. Um, mm -hmm. But again, impact is going to be felt in multiple ways. So, you guys, question. Have you seen the game change in the five years? The game has changed uh, in the pros in five years. And, and like all the time you've been playing. Oh, and, oh, he said five years. Okay, so in all the time that I've been playing? Yeah, just like how the game has changed from the youth and pros. Okay, so when I was little, I was a point guard. That was like an actual thing. Okay, so I was, <laughs> like, my job was facilitation and my ball handling skills had to be good. I had to be able to finish at the basket. Um, and I had to be able to shoot. This is the, the jump shot that we had to be able to make for point guards back then was like a transition free throw line pull up or pull up jump shot off the dribble. but it was all mid range stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. Catching and shooting at the three wasn't like a necessary skill like that. It was good. Like, Oh, he can shoot the three ball. Oh, okay. Like that was like one of those. Like, oh, okay. You can shoot the three. That's nice. But it wasn't a thing because we had bigs. So you had the ball would touch the post a good 50, even 60 percent of the time. Right. So that's a big drastic change in that the lane is wide open, wide open. Like in high school, my junior year, I averaged like 12 or 13 assists and my senior year, I averaged 11 assists. And I would have averaged even more if there were no bigs in the key. What? Oh, my God. That would have been so fun. But, yeah, the game has changed immensely from that because back in the day, you used to be able to just be big, eat, grow tall, make sure your knees are okay. And you're going to be Division One. You know, you're going to have a chance to play pro one day. But you see Eddie Curry, remember Eddie Curry and Tyson Chandler? I know Tyson Chandler. 
Okay, like that time was Eddie Curry and Tyson Chandler came in together, right? There was a question, if I'm not mistaken, I think one of them went number one, the other one went number two. But there was like this back and forth about who should be. Um, and that was when a lot of stuff started to change. I mean, Blake Griffin, I think, got it the most because the game changed right under Blake Griffin's nose as he was about to be one of the greatest players in the game. Um, and it shifted in a way where, you know, you needed to have a jump shot or you needed to have such an immense skill set like a Draymond Green and realize it, what helped Draymond Green is they did not have a big, right? So the biggest shift I've seen changing in the game is how they're, one, how bigger players are used. Mm -hmm. Now what that, let me show you how this trickle, to me, how this trickle down works. So now bigger players are used for other skill things, right? And so you'll have a guy like uh, Dirk Nowitzki, a Kevin Durant, go, guys like that who change the game, where they can catch and shoot, they can do things outside, they can pull bigs away from the basket, right? Yeah. And now that makes getting into the lane a lot easier. Like back in the day, Isaiah Thomas took, I think it was 16 stitches outside, 17 on the inside, because he drove to the lane and Carl Malone gave him a clean one. And I'm pretty sure it was just a regular foul. Like <laughs> shoot two free throws and then come back out. And that's how the league was. Like, they put you on your behind. And so that also with, like, the flagrant one, two, three, five, and seven, and, like, you can't even really blow on somebody without it being a, a blocking foul. You know, so that's changed a lot of the game to where you have guys like James Harden who can get 20 free throws in a night, where it changes the way you have to play defense on people. You know, you can't really body up and do different things. So – your ball handling ability has, has made things skill, that makes skill sets a lot higher. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, who's the last small guard, who's the smallest guard in the league right now that plays that you could think of uh, Isaiah Thomas got cut. So, right. So that plays. Um, Only guy I can think I of don't know. JJ Barea. But, oh. Uh, JJ on the Mavs. Right? On the Mavs, right? Right. Part of that, I think, has to do with the fact that the Mavs have that kind of setup. Right? But in general, that's what I think has changed the most. You've seen skill set come in and change how players have to play. So it makes small guards like myself go overseas, and it allows big guys like Giannis and LeBron to play on the wing, and it puts guards like Rondo on the bench. You know, so if you can't shoot the basketball now, as a guard, especially as a smaller guard, you don't play. People talk about Giannis's jump shot, but Giannis doesn't need a jump shot. He's like 6'10", 6'11", and is a freak, can do all kind of other stuff. So I think that's the big thing. The skill set of the game has advanced. And I think the biggest thing, I think, is natural selection. Players know what, what they're trying to do and what they're trying to get to. And so you have guys that are trying to specialize at six years old. So you're having a whole new world of basketball players you got to get through. Um, that have skill sets that'll expose you, you know. So if your mental toughness isn't there, you won't even make it past 13 a lot of days. Kids start playing basketball at seven, and then we get to 13 years old and you're burnt out, and you haven't even seen the hard days. You haven't even been on the road yet. So Stella has a soccer question. How can soccer relate to basketball? Soccer is the number one relative sport to basketball, actually. Um, a lot of, if you notice, the, a lot of the passing, a lot of how the defense is played, staying in front, the ball handling. I'll be my earliest drills that I used to take from outside of basketball were all soccer drills, all of them, like zigzag drills in between stuff. We're working on all weak foot touches versus weak hand touches, things like that. Being able to score with the left foot and the right foot, um, how you see the the court, how you see the flow. I think if they allowed offsides, offsides in soccer and stuff like that, it would also play more into basketball with like the backdoor cuts and things like that. But I think basketball. Um, if you notice that some of the best players to ever play basketball, Hakeem Olajuwon, Steve Nash, Kobe Bryant, all of them were soccer players first. And then I have a question. Now, so didn't Kobe make his shoe off the torque, the torque of a soccer player's shoe? Oh, yeah, he did. I heard about that. He tweaked it. And the first shoe that acted like Kobe Bryant's shoe is known for having – the anti-roll bar on the back so your ankles don't roll. Remember, Kobe had the low shoe. Steve yeah. Nash's shoe was actually the first one, and they got that concept from soccer. Yeah, that's what I read in his book. Yeah. Steve Nash, though, spearheaded that. 
So uh, a quick break from our sponsors. Welcome back to the BHP Trilogy podcast with Coach Cliff Baker and um, we're going to right back into it. So, yeah. How much has the coronavirus impacted your training? How much has it impacted my training? A lot. <laughs> we're not training. So uh, in an effort to lower the curve, we're not, we're not training. And then my wife is a first responder. So I, I have a bit of a obligation to make sure that I don't see people and I keep complete transparency because if I'm a there's so many things we don't know about the virus so I just don't want to be a silent carrier or you know somebody to start this next wave of the virus but it's impacted my training immensely as far as not allowing me to train but it has impacted my players in a positive way um, because it's forced them to develop driveway player tendencies and habits so Coach Cliff, who's the best player in the NBA right now? Everybody's healthy? Yes. Everybody's healthy. Everybody. Yes. Kevin Durant. I knew he was going to say that. Why? What, what can't he do? Uh, that part. <laughs> I don't what know. Can't he do that part? He's a bro, like the most efficient scorer to ever play basketball. It's between him and Mike, but he's the most efficient scorer to ever play basketball, even if you look at his numbers compared to Mike. Really? What? That boy is a problem. <laughs> Seven foot so, sniper. <laughs> but do you think his ACL injury will affect his game? Achilles. I mean, yeah, Achilles. Yeah, of course. But here's the thing you got to know about a guy like him. Was he doing a lot to have to score the ball anyways? Was he hitting you with like seven dribbles and a bunch of other moves? I mean, but he was with the best team in the NBA, right? He was. Well, but before that, he was giving buckets. With, 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 to me, the worst, like, pure point guard in the league. Yeah. Wait, what do you mean the worst pure point guard? Russell Westbrook is not a pure point guard. Russell oh. Westbrook is a freak of nature who happens to play the one. And, you know, he makes a lot of decisions. Like, he runs down full court, wastes a lot of possessions. Whereas if KD played with a guy like a Chris Paul, like, mm -hmm. KD never played with a point guard who's going to set him up. Ever. And what about Steph Curry? Oh, no, not Curry. Steph Curry's not. Cool. Don't get me started on Steph Curry. Because Steph Curry is between Steph Curry – and this other guy who played for Boston, to me, as the worst MVPs that were ever MVPs. But, again, that's not one of your questions. KD, to me, is the best basketball player in the league right now. So, I'm just saying, if I had to pick up, like, if I had to go pick a team, I'm picking him first. Like, we, we're probably going to win if I got that guy. Mm -hmm. one, one second. Hold on. Hmm? Oh, we're changing the battery on the camera. Okay. Who's your best player in the NBA? I'm sure you're gonna say LeBron. Yeah, I was gonna say LeBron. Cause he can pass and rebound. Cause he can dunk. Oh, I hate you, Todd. I hate you. <laughs> Why don't you like Curry? Your favorite is Jackson. I don't. I don't dislike Curry. I just, I, I kind of end up being the counterbalance when everyone's like, Steph Curry's this. And I'm like, eh. But he wouldn't be that if he wasn't at Golden State. Yeah. He'd be Trey Young. He'd be Trey Young. Really? I think Trey Young's better than where, where Steph Curry was at his age, Trey Young's better. And that may be because of Steph. Steph may have allowed that. But Trey Young's ridiculous. And I think Steph Curry would have that same type of game if it wasn't. He plays – Clay Thompson gets no recognition. I like Clay Thompson. Like, I like him. To me, he's the best player on the team. The most, yeah. Like, every time. He defends everybody. He can score without having to touch the ball. They try to play him like he can't handle the ball, but he can. You know, so I think he's the best player. And he covers a lot of Steph's back. Yeah, because Steph can't play defense. <clears throat> 
So you let go. How would you construct your perfect player using the skill sets of different NBA players? Skill sets of different NBA players. Um, I mean, I guess you want the consistency of Steph Curry's shot, right? So we'll throw his shot in there. I need Kyrie's handles. Those are sticky. Um, I need Chris of current NBA players, right? Yeah. Okay. Because we're not talking about all time. We're talking no. about – Okay. All right. Uh, current NBA players, I'm probably going to go with Chris Paul's vision and leadership. Because, like, I mean, you guys got to see it a little bit in the All-Star game. He changes the game just by being on the court. Mm -hmm. uh, I would go with, uh, of course, Giannis's length. That's just freaky. Um, and the thing about who has good footwork in the league, Jason Tatum. Who has the best footwork in the league right now, bro? Because it used to be Kobe with no questions. Um, uh, I was gonna say Kobe, but. He, yeah, uh, I guess uh, right. Oh, CJ McCollum's footwork is stupid. Really? Yeah, CJ McCollum's footwork is, is nice. I think LeBron has good footwork. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do with this guy. <laughs> like, I don't know what to do. Oh, but Kyrie, Kyrie has good footwork, right? Kyrie does have good footwork. Kyrie does have good footwork. But I, I gave him handles. Like, does it give him everything? Um, oh, well, realistically, yeah. If you give Kyrie's skill set to LeBron, Lord. <laughs> Wait, okay, but what does LeBron need in his game? Oh, just th need nothing. I mean, great by himself. I mean, what he needs, again, we talked about yesterday. If his mentality was, okay, the one thing that he needs, free throws. Free throws. Uh-huh. One thing. Because if he makes free throws, I don't need to stand out here and show his jump shots. Lay up, lay up, ah, foul. Free throw, free throw, lay up, lay up, up, foul, free throw. <laughs> then they're going to back up and give him wide open jump shots. Cool. Huh. Huh. That's, that's the toughest part. We were talking about it yesterday. If he wasn't afraid of the free throw line, bruh. Come on. It'd be no question, to be honest. Like, if he wasn't afraid of the free throw line, I'd be like, yeah, the dude, what can you do? Like, Mike had to do a lot of other stuff. But LeBron has to do this stuff, too, because he's not at the level yet. Mm -hmm. Has LeBron ever ever studied again? Um, what are top three skills players should have? Top three skills a player should have in the game of basketball. One is grit. Grit, mental toughness, however you want to talk about it, but a mental skill set to allow you to keep pushing through stuff. Okay, so however you want to name that, that's the first skill, is a mental skill. And grit is probably the easy way to define it. Um, the second skill set for basketball right now, shooting. If you can shoot it, you got a chance. Like if you can shoot it, you got a chance. And I think um, the third valuable skill set would be um, – Footwork, I think footwork is something that's really often forgotten because footwork transitions, like on the defensive side of the court, a lot of guys don't have good footwork. So they don't know how to close out, cross step, slide step, open step, go back to a, they don't know, they don't have the footwork for that. So they're not able to withstand a lot of the basketball, uh, like offense coming at them because they just can't keep somebody in front of them. So I think grit, shooting, and footwork um, are the most important things I would say. So what's the best advice on developing those skills? The grit, do stuff that sucks every day. Do stuff that, not like, you know, don't go outside and pick a fight every day, but do stuff that is within your growth chart, that's on your plan. Every, every, we should all know our big picture, right? So my big picture, my, my vision for myself is to be, for, for basketball, is to be a skills trainer um, globally that can mm -hmm. speak four languages fluently. Right. So every day for me right now, I got a Rosetta Stone thing I do and then I watch a novella and then I have a couple people like I have five different people that I call and they just like have conversations with me in Spanish. So that's developing my because some I don't want to do it every day. I wish I could just go outside and speak Spanish, but it's something that I need to do. So I put myself through that every day.
I think that's as far as like advice on developing skills, that's it. The second, the last thing I would say is like, steal like an artist, steal like an artist, copy everything that you can copy. Um, our hands, we can't literally make an exact copy of what someone else can. You know, we, we can't actually yeah. do that. So the beauty of it is the more and more we continue to practice um, what our greats are doing and copy the greats and like almost fake it till you make it, you end up making it. So obviously tomorrow the last dance comes out. Uh, what can you tell us about the Bulls and Jordan era? You're gonna find a lot about the Bulls and Jordan era. Um, I think what you'll see is a greatness at a level like we look at what the Warriors did. They gave you guys another peek into what organizational greatness looks like, right? And I think that that's what you're gonna see with the Bulls. We tie a lot of the Michael Jordan and uh, Rodman and Pip and Phil Jackson and all these individual names, um, but it, it was actually the collection of them, right? And they say, like, if I was to ask you right now, what's what's more, five or one? Five. Five, okay? But this is one, all right? One is always going to beat five. And that's oh. the big thing that the Bulls represented is they became one with their five or 10 or whoever it was. So when you talk about like the Bulls dynasty and the legacy and the last dance, um, I think that's one thing that we kind of skip over in the Jordan era is that Jordan, the greatness of Jordan and Phil Jackson and all that, there's a, Jordan even talks about it. He married himself to Phil Jackson. So that last year, the reason why they call it the last dance is because that last year, the organization said, we're not paying these cats. And Phil Jackson, we're not paying you. So Jordan's like, well, I'm not coming back. So they knew it was their last opportunity. And for them to be able to take the last dance and not put any anxiety, any negativity, any fear or malice, but to put nothing but love, organization, dedication, and commitment into it, that's what allowed them to be who they are. So you has one last question. What you got, brother? What's the best advice for kids and teens? The best advice for kids and teens is live life. Like, don't let basketball or one thing become life. Let all those be parts of life. You know, you're, I think the coronavirus is giving us a good opportunity to be with ourselves. And that's the number one person you have to be better than every day. Um, and we get a chance to check in with our habits. You're going to see a lot of people come out of the backside of this and they'll have watched every Netflix show. Um, and then I get a chance to see what you guys are doing. And I'll be honest, you guys are, have been such a motivation to me throughout this time because I get to see you guys are running like your own homeschool academy and you're handling your work and you haven't skipped a beat at all. If anything, you've actually doubled your ability to work and your capacity to work. So um, my advice for any kids and teens is find something you love. Someone told me this a long time ago. The thing that you do when you're procrastinating is probably the thing you should be doing for the rest of your life. You know, and I used to, when I didn't want to do schoolwork or we would do laundry or something, I would roll up the sock, the socks and throw them into the, uh, act like I'm shooting them into the basket, whatever, throwing trash away, act like I'm shooting it. One by, like, all, when I procrastinated, everything I did was basketball related. So it's a blessing for me to be able to walk into that space. So I tell any kid, any teen, um, do that thing. Like, people think basketball is my only thing. Music is my main thing, you know, and it will always be, and it's not something that I need to have out in front street, but it, it, it keeps me going, you know? So have something that's bigger than, than basketball. All right, thank you, Coach Cliff, for being on our podcast. Thank you, guys. It was good, thank you. Uh, so next time, this is the BHP Trilogy Podcast. Peace out.